There are a lot of people releasing first impressions videos about their thoughts of Dark Deity, the Fire Emblem community's newest buzz. Should you buy? Should you not buy? And personally, I'm not sure how a few hours of gameplay can really give you that level of an informed opinion. So while I'd thought about doing that myself, I figured that it's near impossible to talk fairly about a game that I haven't played through completely, and it's honestly just not my style. So, here we are, about three days later, and I've actually finished the entire game, and I find myself with a lot to say about it, so I figured now is probably a good time to review and share my opinion with everyone. This is also going to be fairly spoiler-free, um, it's probably going to have some like minor gameplay mechanics and stuff like that, but nothing major, and for people who want a more in-depth breakdown, I will have a full spoiler, deep analysis kind of thing coming later on, so you can check that out at a later date. Just a quick disclaimer before I start the review, however, they did give me a free copy of the game uh, from Freedom Games, who are the publisher of Dark Deity. And aside from that, I've also had a decent amount of close communication with the development team ever since they very nicely agreed to sit down for a discussion about the game with me about a year ago, so I have that kind of back and forth with them. But for both your sake and theirs, I'm going to make sure that my review here is very honest and constructive as possible because let's be real, at the end of the day, dishonest and or harmful feedback doesn't really help anyone. I'm also going to give away two free copies of the game, so if you're interested, I'm not going to go on a big spiel about it in the video here, just check the description for the details on how to enter for the uh, free copies of the game. So yeah. Now, if you're at all familiar with my review series, I basically structure it based on game elements, and for Dark Deity, this will be no exception. I know there's a lot of specific criticisms flying around right now, so I'll address those at the end. I'll put timestamps in video segments to indicate each part I'm going to talk about, so if you're interested, you can jump around, go directly to that, or listen to the whole thing. But in the interest of structure, I'm going to start with the game's strongest suit, and I think that's the gameplay. I'm not kidding when I say the game is actually super fun to play. Like, I'm not gen I'm genuinely not exaggerating here. At its core, it's a turn-based strategy RPG, like we're all really used to. You move your units, and then the enemy moves, and you take turns until you fulfill the objective or you fail. Pretty simple. However, where Dark Deity excels is in the customization of its class system. Everyone starts in a basic class, but from there onwards you get to select to promote into any of the four tier 2 classes at level 10, and then once again when you hit level 30 you get a free selection of any of the four tier 3 classes. So this gives each unit a possible 16 unique combinations of classes, each with differing playstyles, growths, and skills along the way. I honestly think this provides a decent amount of replayability value with you being able to go back and not only try new characters, but also older ones and builds you may not have tried before. Every unit also has their own personal skill, as well as gains two permanent class skills per promotion, so that helps also individualize the units themselves. There's also a little twist in the way that character death and weapon advantages are managed. Character deaths result in something called a grave wound, where instead of a character being permanently dead, they simply retreat with a permanent stat reduction and a random stat and stat quantity. I think this is interesting, since it lets you go forward at the cost of a debuff to your unit without permanently losing that unit. So say if you find yourself at the end of a long, arduous chapter, you can just be like, you know, screw it, I don't care if my main character dies and loses one luck, I'm just gonna push on, finish the chapter, and then I'll start with the minus one luck for the next one. The weapon advantages here are different, we don't have the traditional sword beats axes, axes beat lances, lances beat swords, instead it's weapon types versus armor types, and the specific weapons give specific advantages against specific types of armors. I said the word specific a lot, I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Anyways, this wouldn't be a gameplay section without talking about the map design and the enemy placement, and I know you've all seen that image circulating around of Chapter 18's map that looks oddly similar to a heavily criticized Echoes map with, you know, the bridge and the line of calves. I'm gonna be very blunt about this. Yes, there's bad maps in this game. What a shocker. Some of them look bad, some of them play bad. There's over 25 chapters in this game, a lot of which are fun to play and fun to figure out. Singling out the worst map in the game and using it as a blanket statement is pretty unfair. And having completed the game myself, I can very confidently say there were a handful of maps that were challenging and engaging, with the majority being, you know, standard strategy RPG maps. And there's also a handful of duds, so there's some really good ones, there's a lot of, you know, average or mediocre ones that are fine, and then there's, you know, a decent or a small amount of bad ones. It happens. Fire Emblem isn't perfect. I'm sure every strategy RPG has its own share of bad maps. It is what it is. 
Personally, if you ask me, I thought the first half of the game had more interesting maps and objectives than the second half of the game, and that's just my complete game take on it. That doesn't mean the late game doesn't have good maps, but I felt the early game had stronger ones. There's one defense map in particular that I felt was very high pressure, and that was in the first half of the game. And then there's a few maps later on that have some very interesting boss mechanics that will forever be memorable to me, but I can't go into detail about them here in this video just because of the sensitive nature of spoilers, so I'm gonna avoid that, and they'll, I'll definitely talk about it in the next video that I'm planning for Dark Deity. In terms of enemy density and enemy placement, Dark Deity's maps are pretty big, actually, and they're, and they're no stranger to large masses of enemies that can cause even the FE4 haters out there to experience some serious deja vu. There are usually two ways to approach these, as in any strategy RPG, you can bait and kill, or you can rush and punish. The former is generally the most common approach, and while it does work most of the time here in the early game, and even into the mid and late game, if you're not using the right counter or matchup, some of the late maps have some very dangerous enemies, like we're talking about, you know, doing 40 damage with a 50% chance to crit. That's not a joke. You want to, you know, roll the coin flip, that's up to you. But, you know, baiting doesn't even work. Even I was sometimes scared about my strongest and most reliable unit, but I trusted in my girl Brooke, and she defied some of the most outrageous odds I've ever seen, you know, but I, I digress. Like I said earlier, the enemies in this game have relatively high crit rates, and I think this comes from the fact that there's no such thing as crit resistance, neither on your side or the enemy side. They also have pretty high HP, and they can have high avoid and hit really hard sometimes. You will find yourself not being able to bring them down with one unit and not even in a single round sometimes, and I found myself very often needing multiple units, and sometimes if I'm really unlucky I need multiple turns to take down a single enemy. It made me feel very frustrated at some points, but ultimately it's just really fun trying to make your units as insanely powerful as possible in order to be able to go up against these problematic units. I'm no expert on unit placement and map design by any means, but for the most part, I didn't feel like any of this was subpar except in a few occasions. Near the end of the game, it's far more common to split up your team into two groups, and even then I didn't have too much of an issue clearing the waves of enemies that come at you. I also forgot to mention, I played the game on the middle difficulty, which is what I was told it's balanced around. And I'm not saying it doesn't offer any challenge. There are certainly maps that do offer a challenge, and are pretty dangerous, but if you build your units a specific way, I know I had two units that were absolutely cracked. Like, you couldn't beat them, you couldn't kill them unless they were mobbed by like six or seven enemies at a time, and all those enemies landed hits. So the normal mode can be difficult, especially if you go down certain routes and your units aren't optimized. I can't even imagine what the highest difficulty is like, to be completely honest with you. Aside from that, the gameplay brings in an interesting weapon and equipment system. There are four types of weapons, every unit has these four types and you can level them up with tokens that you either get as drops from enemies on the map or you buy with in-game gold. These weapons focus on four things. You can either focus on power, you can focus on crit, you can focus on accuracy, or a balanced all-rounder that has a little bit in each stat. Weapon weight is also factored in here accordingly as well, and that weighs you down and calculates with your speed and all that stuff that we're normally used to. When you initiate combat, you can select freely between any four of these weapons. So if, say, if you're trying to one-shot a bulky knight, you can select your power magic. If you're trying to double something that's slightly faster and you need a lighter weapon, you can use a balanced weapon or a crit weapon or an accuracy weapon. Stuff like that, it gives you a lot of flexibility in the way that you want to play the game. And there's also no durability, so I guess that's a bonus for people who don't like weapon durability. The equipment system of this game are called the Eternal Aspects. You'll get these periodically throughout the game, and one thing that I didn't like very much is that there are sort of two instances where the game just dumps them on you. Now, story-wise, they work, but I didn't... I think th they could have spread these out more often. You could have earned them through specific map objectives, stuff like that. The fact that they were just given to me in, like, two blocks of ten, and then I had to, like, sift through them is kind of weird. It takes away the emphasis away from them. But they are interesting. They give each unit sort of an extra special ability. They can either give you flat stats. You can swap around stats. You can only equip one at a time, but they really do go further in helping you customize your unit. And that brings me to the final point here, talking about unit customization. Like I said earlier, the unit customization is one of the best things in this game, and this really Really takes it another level further in terms of the equipment. Speaking of customization, I'm kind of slotting this in here under gameplay, but the game also does give you the option to create sort of a randomizer, 0% growth, you can finic you can like fiddle around with the gold income that you get, stuff like that. It allows you to alter a bunch of gameplay options to really tailor your own experience however you like. So all that is, you know, a nice bonus. We always go around saying like, oh, I want to randomize FE7, or oh, I want a 0% growth FE8, stuff like that. Dark Deity gives you that from the let go. You don't have to hack it, you don't have to do 
anything to it. All you do is you go into the options when you start the game and you pick whatever you want and you go from there. So yeah, far and away, the best part to take away from the gameplay here is the class customization, the class system, you know, how much fun it really is to sit down and actually play the game. It really, really is very fun. Like I had monstrosity units that I would just throw in and like watch move and, you know, do all the SRPG stuff that we, we know and love, like the tactical play and stuff like that. So it's just super exciting to see your unit investments pay off and annihilating like all these strong enemy units. I think it is genuinely very fun to play, but, and you know, I've said nothing but positive things here aside from a few negative things, and we will have to get into the negatives. There's no game that's perfect. This one suffers from certain things. There's quite a few bugs, and I'll talk about this more towards the end of the video, but I wanna say that there isn't anything that prevented me from clearing the game or using a certain class or using a certain character. There may be some out there that I haven't encountered personally. I've only played through the game once. I didn't use every class. I didn't use every character, but in general, my experience with the gameplay was pretty smooth. I encountered a few different bugs. There were always ones that I could work through or work my way around. So there was nothing game breaking to me. I know people have had crashes and stuff like that. Personally, I didn't experience any, but I do know it's there and they're working hard to fix it. One of my bigger issues is the controls. They can feel really clunky and unfriendly at times, and that didn't really improve with my progression. Like until the end of my game, I suffered from the menu being half off the screen sometimes if the character I moved was at the bottom of the screen. It was really annoying because you had to cliff, click off, move your screen down, click on the character again, move them again, make sure the menu pops off so just so I can use wait, wait or you know change an item around or something like that. That was my biggest issue with it. Now, since then, they actually released a patch today that fixed that, uh, which is patch 1.03. So they are taking these things into consideration and fixing them along the way. It also seems like it's impossible to play freely completely on a controller. The mouse and the controller controls are both active at the same time and they can interfere with each other during action selections. I never use a controller, but I've been told by some of my friends who have that it can get kind of annoying. Uh, I played with mouse controls. It's not perfect, but it is something you get used to after a while. Some of the confirmations are weird. You might be misclicking. It really is a control scheme that takes getting used to. I'm sure this is something that can be more optimized and these are things I definitely expect them to fix while they roll out patches in the future, but at the moment, there are still a little bit of issues with the controls. Another thing I was really lost on when I started playing the game was the game mechanic explanations. There's absolutely no tutorial, you just get thrown right in, and they tell you very few things, like the whole armor system, none of that was explained to me, weapon system and how that works, none of that was explained. There was a tips section in the game early on that wasn't updated at all. I've since been told that now it's been updated. All of that was, you know, me figuring out my own thing until then, so I never really went back to it. I personally like figuring things out on my own. I'm sure a lot of new players will disagree with me and might even find it frustrating. So the fact that they're upgrading and updating their tips section is really nice. I feel like it would be very good if you would even at the beginning just point people towards like, hey, there's a tips section. We recommend you read this or look at this before you start the game to understand certain game mechanics. So that's it for all the gameplay stuff. Let's move on to something more fun and talk about sort of the artsy portion of this game or the artistic section. And I'll start once again from the best parts. The character art in this game, phenomenal. The designs of every character are on point. They're all unique. The art is super high quality. Some of the scene art that you see in the background, beautiful. Like it looks amazing between the chapters or to emphasize some of the story segments, it looks really good. The way it's drawn and it showcases the characters, absolutely stunning. It shines very, very strongly. So that's the art. I thought it was all fantastic. I really have nothing bad to say about it. The game also has a small amount of voice acting. This really helps add some personality to the characters and bring them to life. We've all gotten very accustomed to voice acting in most of the games. Here, it's not as extensive, it's not fully voice act, it's little barks and critical quotes, which are nice. I won't go into the details, but it's very satisfying to see your character like land a critical hit and go right between the eyes and then completely obliterate an enemy. Uh, one of my favorite ones, uh, personal crit quotes, is from a character who goes, I'm a healer. And I thought that's absolutely hilarious because he's a healer and healers can attack in this game. It feels like a little bit of a reference to uh, past games, Fire Emblem games, where healers didn't attack or they technically shouldn't be fighting. So I thought that was really funny. One thing they did really do well, I'll go on a little tangent here, is the little references that they scattered throughout the game. I noticed, personally, one of the, the longbow upgrade quotes was, um, 
It's a reference to Shannon from Path of Radiance that says one clean motion, no hesitation. I think in this one they said one smooth motion or something like that, but I really quickly latched onto it and I'm sure a lot of other people who understand references will get it very quickly. But back to the voice acting, I thought it was a great touch and the greedy person in me would have loved a fully voiced game, but I understand that's a big task and the budget probably wouldn't have allowed for it. But otherwise, their cast was really well put together, and the ones I heard and played as fit and performed the roles very well. They all did great, uh, but I gotta give a special shout out to whoever did some of my personal favorites, Brooke, Monroe, and Naturally Sloan. I enjoyed those three a lot, seeing them brought to life, so that was really cool. Another one of the artistic elements here are the animations. These animations are amazing. They're out of this world. Like, I've been on record saying that uh, the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem sprite animations are great. Dark Deity delivers some top-notch quality here with their sprite attacks, their crits, their dodge animations. I can't do anything but sit here and clap for the animators and spriters here. They did some really, really good work and deserve all the praise they can get. Legit nothing but positives to he here to say. The animations only get crazier and crazier the higher your class tier is. Not to mention every single one of the spells has its own unique animations. It's insane. Really, really amazing stuff. And just to put a little note in here, the art, the voice acting, and the animations are all things that carry forward from the beginning to the end. Like, the art and the voice acting are always consistent throughout the game, and the animations only improved further on you move in the class tree and the weapon trees. So I thought it was all stellar. But like all things, what goes up must come down, and there's always going to be some things that are good and some things that are bad. And in terms of an artistic standpoint here, I think they missed the boat with the music and the sound effects. I've been seeing this complaint around a lot. I'm not a huge music or sound effect guy, but when I go back and I listen to it, I can sort of hear how the monotony of the map theme comes and goes. The sound effects don't always feel like weapon on armor or that it really matches the weight of the attack or the way the attack happens. And I don't really know how to explain it or how to fix it. Obviously there's some really good ones like when the HP bar on the right hand side for the enemy shatters and goes away. That actually sounds really good, but a lot of the sound effects didn't land. So there, there are some diamonds in the rough, but there also are a lot of things that could be improved upon. And the good news is this is something they can definitely fix. You will eventually get used to it and they can become background noise. You can also just turn off the music and put on whatever you want yourself. But in general, it's something that you're constantly going to hear. And after the first few li listens, it does start to feel a little bit generic and repetitive with not much variation going forward. Whenever I did hear a new map theme though, or some new combat themes, it's pretty nice. It's, it, it's definitely a change of pace and you do feel it, but I found it lacking in what I would like to call things like impact tracks. Impact tracks are what I would call so, sort of some of the more epic or impactful scores from games that really help support an emotional scene or add some grandeur to an epic moment or, you know, even a snazzy recruitment theme for when you get a new unit. Stuff like that would really go a long way to help, you know, give the game some flourish, some, you know, fanfare, stuff like that. I'm also going to tack this on here to the segment since it kind of goes along with visuals, but my game ran really well without any stuttering or crashes. The frame rate was consistent. It was pretty seamless run experience. I have a pretty good PC though, and I have heard reports of people having crashes and issue issues, so I assume it's really tied to the quality of your hardware. All right, so we're getting near the end of the review, and it's time to talk about what is usually my favorite part of the games. Story and characters. Everyone who knows me knows I'm huge on story and characters and development and especially villains. And while I like to save the best for last here, unfortunately with Dark Deity, there's going to be a lot of story criticism. There are a few shining moments in the story and these are exceptions that confirm the, the rule, but let's start with some of the positives about the story and characters. Dark Deity has a system called bonds in which characters build up three levels of bonds that unlock conversations between them that help forward character development as well as give us some more lore and insight to the world. It's great. Some of these are genuinely high quality and they really helped cement sort of my love or lack of it for some of the characters as well as gives me some decent insight into the goings on of the world we're playing in. The problem is this is where about 95% of the character development and even the story background can be sometimes. And in a regular playthrough, you're just not going to be able to unlock all of the bonds for all the characters. And it leaves you missing out on some crucial information to the lore of the game or even backstory of some characters. And just to give you an idea of how significant this can be, there are some characters who just randomly show up and don't make sense in the grand scheme of the narrative whatsoever. I'll keep this spoiler free, but there's a character who hides away in your boat and then after you get back from one of your quests, 
they just show up and they just join you at a, at a certain point with like barely any explanation or real reference to the reasoning. They just pop up. They're like, oh, I was here. I'm going to join you guys. And they all go, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And I love the character because of their quotes and some of the funny bonds I've seen, but I don't think I still even properly understand them given that I didn't unlock all the bonds. It just feels somewhat jarring and kind of odd to me and definitely a little bit confusing. Aside from that, this doesn't take into account some of the minor problems that Dark Deity's narrative has. It starts off as a fairly standard power of friendship story of the characters going on different missions, and they find themselves in a scenario to save the world from an evil presence. Sounds fairly standard and simple, and I probably simplified it here more for the sake of keeping this spoiler free, but a lot of the chapters feel like they were written separately, and they need a little bit more of a transitional scene to give context and flesh out the characters' thoughts, motivations, and reasons for doing what they're doing. I know in the early game, I definitely found myself confusing with what was going on. It was like I'm watching anime, and I suddenly skipped an episode because my team would be in one spot, and then all of a sudden be at another with very minor reasoning or instruction as to how we got to this place or the conclusion to do this. Oftentimes you'll get like five minutes of basic dialogue after huge story portions in between the chapters, and then your team just moves on, as if nothing happened in the previous chapter. They never come back, they never revisit things, they never think about it, the characters don't seem to develop or suck it in or personalize any of the things that they go through. There didn't seem to be any continuous themes that got referenced as the story progressed and the villains just kind of seemed to be there behind the scenes. They just existed most of the time until you were ready to take the fight to them. You guys know I'm a huge fan of villains, and I always look forward to what the game's villain has to offer. There's about two or three main ones here, depending on how you view it, and I'll keep it honest with you completely. They are very basic. The backstory on them isn't anything very special, and the interactions and motivations they have with each other aren't even very well explained. Where did they come from? How did they meet? Why are some of them listening to each other and helping each other out in the first place? Stuff like that that you would think would be extremely basic between the villains, and ma again, maybe this is all in the bonds that I didn't unlock, but I feel like this is core story, you know? Sometimes in games you can have 30 to 40 minute segments of just lore being pumped out at the player. There's nothing wrong with that. And so I think the focus on the gameplay element here may have weakened the story or the amount of story that we got. There was also another thing that I found really jarring, and it was how underutilized some of the unique NPCs are. Now, I've actually reached out to the devs about this, and I was talking about my game experience, and it seems like some of these NPCs and bosses were rewards for backing the Kickstarter for certain amounts, and they were inserted by the backers. Now, I understand that it's really hard once your game and story are written to incorporate a new character within the lore and development, but these characters had super unique designs, they were really cool to see, and they did have a minor amount of story integration. So when a character shows up once or twice and then completely vanishes afterwards, I'm just like, what? Like, wait, what, what happened here? Like, this character is actually really cool. Like, we could have seen more of them written into the story, more of them moving forward. For example, there's a chapter where one of these unique characters asks you to avoid a certain boss character as you clear the chapter. What do you usually understand from a scenario like this? This is like, it's a sub goal, like a mini quest that you would usually do to get a reward at the end of it. It presents an opportunity for a unique map objective clear reward moving forward, but instead, we actually just avoid this character, we never hear or see from them again. And it's not just one instance, there's a few of them that pop up along the way. You know, just cases where things are suggested by the story to be what I would consider an optional map objective, but you never get them capitalized on, you're never rewarded for it, sometimes it never gets referenced again. It would have been nice to get like a stat booster, for example, or, you know, something like that, a really good healing item, maybe some extra eternal aspects for doing this. Just stuff like that that could be added. I I'm sure that could be probably be patched in in that one, in one instance I'm talking about. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Another thing that I feel could have been capitalized on a little bit more is that a lot of the maps had random faceless enemy units as the boss instead of actual characters with dialogue, motivations, and plot reference. It was always more so about the mission instead of the reason behind the mission or the people involved. And this really would have offered a point for gameplay and story integration that could have been very seamless, but instead it creates a barrier between that, and it kind of takes the wind out of the sails of the story for a bit because you have less of an anchor and less of investment in the enemy units. So I, I would have really loved some more, you know, face enemies, some actual characters to stand in your way in the story. 
I know it probably seems like I'm being pretty harsh in this segment, and all of this is nothing but tough love, because I really hold story and characters to a much higher standard than most other things in a game, and that's just gen generally what I care about the most. Anyways, that's pretty much all the main elements in the game to talk about, but now we have a little bit of me sort of discussing a little bit of the intricacies of the behind the scenes of Dark Deity, or at least to give some context into the development of the game. Like I said in the intro, I actually know some of the people on the development team. I've spoken to them multiple times. You know, I've spoken to them a lot in the past few days since the game released as well. This is a very small indie development team, like as small as it gets, and they're working on their first game ever. And I know we were all excited and had very high expectations of what Dark Deity is, but I think it's really unfair for us to sit here and judge a $20 game that is being made by people with no prior experience and judge it by the AAA industry standard $60 games. I heard people making references to how this is like cyberpunk. I am sorry, but that is absolutely ludicrous. CD Projekt Red is a very well-known developer with multiple successful AAA games under their belt. They have a massive budget and a large development team. Dark Deity has one programmer. One. One person is building this game from scratch. Let that sink in. I'm not making any excuses for them, but there's a little bit of context that we need to understand when we sit here and talk and critique and judge a game like this. It's being made by a minuscule team with absolutely no experience or prior experience before. They are learning as they go. Now, did I think this game needed more development time and possibly a larger team to be even better and be the product that we would have wanted in our ideal world? In my opinion, I agree. I think it absolutely does. I think there's certain elements that are too obviously untested, simply because of the size of the team and the amount of stuff that needs to be worked on. There's some very simple things, like the fact that three range snipers can be counterattacked by two range enemies, or certain skills just flat out not working like the illusionist's avoid buff or the sniper's hit rate skill. Really basic stuff that would have needed some more testing, and I'm sure there would have been a lot of volunteers that were more than willing to do that. So I think with time, all of these stuff will get patched in and will get worked on, and they've released three patches in three days already, so just give them some time to improve that. However, I know that in this day and age, Everyone has a different opinion on what is and isn't worth it, and what is and isn't an acceptable standard for a complete project. I'm not going to get into that here. That is for every single person to make their own informed opinion on. For me personally, I play games in general to have fun. I usually go by a $1 per hour rule as to what is worth it for me, unless it was an absolutely miserable experience. For me, here, with Dark Deity, I am very happy, or I would have been very happy, to pay $20 for this game and get the 30 hours of gameplay I got out of it, because I genuinely had so much fun with the segments that I liked. Obviously, by my review, you can see there are a lot of things that I didn't like, or a lot of things that I was disappointed by, but at the end of the day, I woke up every day, and I played about 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours of Dark Deity, I think I played 16 hours on the first day. I was hooked! I had so much fun with this game. So. You know, that's for everyone to judge. The gameplay for me really shone, and I had so much fun with it. So I'm not going to sit here and reiterate how much fun I had with it, because I think I, I've already talked enough about what I do like and what I don't like. What I will say is if you are a paying customer and you ended up unsatisfied with the quality of your product, you're absolutely entitled to your opinions, no doubt. But I think it's important for us as a community to give some respectful, honest, and constructive feedback to these growing developers who are trying to create games. Like I said earlier, it's been out for three days and we've already gotten three separate patch updates once every single day. All of this is based on feedback from the players to help fix some of the more glaring issues. So I can tell the difference already between day one and now. The team is constantly reading and working tirelessly to update the game and I know that for a fact just by seeing the patches and talking with them over the last couple days. Anyways, I don't want to go for too much longer. At the end of the day, I'm here to give you the most complete and honest truth and let you make your own decisions on whether or not Dark Deity is worth it for you. And with that out of the way, I think it's time to give this game a proper score and a final evaluation. I am going to give Dark Deity a 6.5 on the sizzling scale. I debated back and forth as to how I was going to rate this game, and I think in its current state, this is just where it resides. There are simply too many gameplay bugs and inconsistencies at the moment that need to be fixed to fairly rate it any higher than that. 
and the story and characters bring it down quite a bit for me as well. Again, that's just my personal taste. I'm not going to give it a failing grade though because the gameplay really does shine and it's so much fun to play. And I honestly think once all the kinks are ironed out, the experience will only get smoother. I think the game is pretty fun. It's definitely a worthwhile experience to me the way it is right now, but feel free to adopt a wait and see approach over the next coming week or so and see what the developers have in store for us. Again, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching the video. Let me know what you think about Dark Deity or my review in the comments below. I'm excited to hear your opinions, whether you agree or disagree with me. And if you want to enter the giveaway, once again, check the description. And I'll see you guys all in the next video. Peace.